Gus founded Project Assistance in 1996 to transform our client's approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence in execution that consistently delivers expected project outcomes. Gus is a portfolio and project management expert. He's a published author of many popular articles and books on the subject of project management, including contributions to several editions of Macmillan's popular QBook series, Special Edition, using Microsoft Project. He's also the author of the project management content in the third edition of Expediting Drug and Biologics Development, and he's been a presenter at several, several national meetings of the Drug Information Association. Gus? Thank you, Jan, and good afternoon, everybody. This afternoon, we're going to cover the following agenda. Uh, the, the subject matter background will be uh, approached from the overview and framework of the key process domains that we're going to talk about today. Those process domains being portfolio management, project management, and knowledge management, which you'll also see me refer to as project lifecycle management. We'll get into that a little bit later. Uh, next, we'll cover putting these processes in context. So taking this overall process, uh, these three process domains and how they fit into this context of people, technology, and change management. Uh, we'll then move on to discussing some best practices for integrating portfolio project management and knowledge management. Uh, that's the heart of today's presentation. And then we're going to drill down a little bit into the end part of those best practices, which is the, uh, the tactical plan, and discuss some of the dimensions uh, around portfolio project and knowledge management. And then we'll leave some time for next steps and some follow-up questions at the end. So our first subject is going to be this overview of key process domains, the portfolio management, project management, and knowledge management. And what I'll do uh, first is I'd, I'd like to put these, these three key process domains into context. So at the top of, of this pyramid I'm about to present, we have uh, something called portfolio management, which is our strategy and governance layer, a set of processes that we use uh, when we're setting up a project portfolio, meaning a portfolio filled with projects. We have these key process areas like proposing projects, selecting which projects will be uh, performed or, or, or approved, uh, measuring progress, responding to how the measurement of that progress is going. So that governance uh, set of processes is defined at the portfolio management level. Uh, we then see another uh, two of the key of the three key process domains today, uh, project management and program management on the bottom right hand side, which we use as a set of business controls to drive on time on budget uh, at the project execution layer. And then also this concept of knowledge management, which we drive adoption of project management process at the execution level. And by the way, just a quick note at the bottom. This idea of knowledge management, we're really talking about managing the knowledge that occurs within the project itself, the project life cycle. And uh, a little bit more on that in just a few minutes. So what are the business drivers? Why, you know, why do it? Let's, let's start there. Why, why be good at uh, portfolio management, project management, life cycle management? And so we see in the portfolio uh, management key dimension, selecting the right projects. Why is this important? Well, we want to make sure we're working on the right initiatives that support the overall business objectives. What's the business trying to accomplish and how can these projects in fact support those, those goals? Uh, how do we monitor the key performance indicators for each project to make sure we're doing what we said we were going to do? Are we, are we making our commitments? And, uh, and ultimately, if we're not making our commitments and, and something that's uh, uh, somewhat of a luxury in a lot of portfolio management situations is what do we do about the things that aren't going well? Can we rapidly respond to business conditions? Can we realign initiatives? Can we take projects off that shouldn't be happening? Can we put new ones on? Uh, in the middle domain, key process area, this idea of delivering on time and on, and on budget, how do we ensure that we have a consistent set of business controls that provide for on time, on budget delivery, because that's what project management is? Uh, can the tools and technologies provide a means to rapidly uh, affect adoption of project management best practices? And what about uh, the investment necessary. Project management doesn't come for free. So, you know, is there the organizational wherewithal investment to really make this happen? And then finally, in the, in, in the knowledge area of, well, of the outcomes of the project, delivering the project on spec, how do we make sure the work is structured to meet the, the specifications of the project? Uh, in other words, what's the suggested work breakdown structure for project phases, tasks, activities? How do we organize work? 
And what are the standard process steps within each task? So a task can be uh, a big piece of work. What, what happens within that task to make sure that we know uh, what, what we need to do to deliver consistent quality? So they're the business drivers that will, that, that will be the backdrop of why do this. Um, what do we really mean when we talk about portfolio management? Uh, this is a picture, a, a sample, if you will, of a potential portfolio management process. And I, and, I, and I put this out there as a reference point to get the concept down of what do we mean by driving uh, a set of initiatives from the top down? What do we mean by strategizing, capturing, formulating? If we look across the bottom, we see that strategizing is about analyzing the business, setting business drivers, establishing a strategy. The dots you see on the screen, the, the red, the red, yellow, uh, sorry, yes, the red, yellow, and green dots, uh, represent different initiatives. And we see as we move from the left to the right, we take a large number of ideas, and we send them through some kind of a process that results in actual delivery of some of those ideas, but not all of those ideas. Portfolio management being across the bottom, those 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 major process areas that we want to have uh, get executed in order to have the outcomes deliver the projects that we're committing to. The next area we want to discuss briefly, the project management process. And again, this is a, this is a generic uh, view. We can see these drawn lots of different ways. But ultimately, we see three major groupings of processes, a definition and planning process for how projects occur. Some of that will be linked if you were on the last webinar where we, we talked about the integration points between project and portfolio management. Clearly there's an integration point between the definition and planning process at the project level as it feeds up into the portfolio level to talk about how we uh, are going to propose, for example, the schedule and the budget for a project. We then see at the execution level, once this project gets approved, some of the basic uh, process patterns around tracking status, around uh, looking at variances and the root cause of those variances against the initial plan. Uh, how we manage risk, how we communicate about the project status, uh, how we do scope management. And again, there are connection points between here and the portfolio level where we report back from active projects or in-flight uh, flights, if you will, the ones that have left the airport, what's going on, are they going to land on time or not. Then we see the closeout. The next one I want to talk about to put things in context is life, this, this idea of life cycle management. What are those tasks in a project plan that deliver the outcomes? Project management has a set of tasks around planning and tracking and reporting, and they're really about controlling the business of the project. But what about what the project's actually going to make? So this idea of the life cycles being things like a consumer product development project life cycle, a work breakdown structure, a set of sample tasks and phases, what we might be calling uh, in this world of consumer product development, maybe a stage gate methodology. Uh, in the software development area, a set of tasks or major phases that might be called something like an SDLC or a software development life cycle. Or if you're familiar with the Software Engineering Institute uh, Capability Maturity Model or CMMI, all those kinds of standards ultimately drive the structure of my projects, the work breakdown structure. Uh, architectural engineering design, how we, how we construct uh, buildings and houses and, and, and those types of projects. Uh, another set of tasks, uh, very related to consumer product development, but unique due to the fact that we're talking about uh, drugs that are put into human beings or sometimes animals, biopharma development, and a whole methodology around that, and therefore uh, a set of suggestions that would drive the structure of a project plan. And finally, and these are examples, this is not, not intended to be uh, comprehensive, uh, something like a government project delivery methodology and uh, some of the standards that exist around that, for, for example, DCAA. Uh, some, some of the uh, uh, earned value management tracking that the Defense Contract Audit Agency requires in order to, to run certain types of projects. So that might drive a different set of tasks in my project plan. So how does this all come together? There is an integrated process framework. If I go uh, from the initial pyramid slide that I looked at back on slide 7, uh, we had a, an overall grouping of, of, of major processes. But now let's talk about how they fit together. Portfolio management is the right projects. So we see that funnel now feeding into the actual projects that get performed. And I often refer to this as a horizontal process. Why? Because it sits horizontally across all these types of projects. So the vertical processes, the on-spec processes, uh, sit under the business controls. Then ultimately, why are we doing all this? Because we're looking for the outcomes. We're looking for the promise of what the project was intended to deliver, or what in the portfolio world sometimes is referred to as benefits realization. And the benefits realization comes through the savings because 
we put in a more efficient manufacturing plant or we put in a better software system or we developed a consumer product that's going to increase our sales and, 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 and uh, improve our market presence. Uh, we've put out uh, some, some uh, a program for the government to produce uh, maybe uh, a new aircraft. Okay, so put it, so, so there are the processes. Now we want to put this in context. If we talk about process in context, we can't ignore these, these dimensions of people, technology, and change management. So, and, and executive support, obvious, and we'll get to that a little bit later, but we have executive support in the middle. But this idea, this idea of the theories of portfolio management, project management, project lifecycle management, they become process specific to an organization. So that's one context we have for the processes is we take those, the things like we might have seen maybe on a slide nine that says, well, here's what a portfolio management process looks like. How do I then take that down into a specific process for my organization? How do I then look at that process in terms of the type of technology that that process uh, will be enabled through? So I may have a technology of a portfolio management tool or a project management tool. And how can I have that process support that? The, the people capabilities. And we'll talk a little bit about some of these details in a moment. And then ultimately the change management. How do I get these other three dimensions to, to, to play in context and to produce the, the outcomes of the improved outcomes of the projects? And the analogy I use oftentimes is, is this concept of a fighter pilot. You know, if you, if you think about the complexity uh, for an organization to approach improvement of portfolio project and life cycle management, if, if uh, I've asked the question oftentimes uh, to a group, uh, what's the unit of measure? that we would take in order to improve an organization's approach to these things. Is in other words, unit of measure. Does it take hours to get better at this? Does it take days? Does it take weeks? Does it take months? Does it take quarters? Does it take years? And, and a common answer from a group that understands this, you know, this challenge of bringing these capabilities together is it takes years, at a minimum quarters. Not that we can't make intermediate steps, and we'll talk about those today uh, at, at the core of our presentation. Not that we can't make those intermediate steps to get incremental return on investment during that journey, during that process of getting better. But the reality is it is a little bit like becoming an F-16 pilot because the first thing an F-16 pilot does is not to get in the cockpit and climb out at 10,000 feet per minute. Okay, so people capabilities. Some questions we need to answer. Does the organization even have a formal project management role? Is it well defined? Are the outcomes of project management, uh, uh, of the projects linked to project manager compensation? Uh, is there a project management community and how is it supported? Is there a project management office or an enterprise project management office or a portfolio management office or some of these terms we see out there? Where's, where, you know, who carries the banner to, to help enable the capabilities of the people who need to improve from neophytes potentially into fighter pilots? Can an improved project and portfolio pr uh, management infrastructure be implemented that, that project managers understand? So, in other words, are we are we overmatching the technology to the capabilities of the people? And if so, how do we how do we deal with that? Okay, so if not, what's the plan to improve those capabilities? The tools and technology dimension. Uh, will tools and technology automate newer existing uh, processes? So one of the first questions is, well, what do we have now? What are we trying to accomplish? Uh, will we provide for the integration of the key process framework? Will the technology become an enabler? to do that. Okay? Can technology be chosen that matches the organization's target project management maturity level and the associated requirements to get there? So not technology for the sake of technology, but technology for the sake of some prescribed landing point for the organization. We know we want to be this good at portfolio project and life cycle management. We know what our requirements are. Is there, are there tools and technology out there that support that arrival point, that landing point, that end point for evolution? for the organization. I mentioned the enabler. Will, will the tools and technology be an enabler or an obstacle to progress? Uh, many of you probably have seen where some fancy new piece of technology is chosen and put into an organization and it slows things down. It, it, it makes project managers that used to be productive not be productive. And, and, and some of that's understandable. Anything new uh, has an adoption cycle to it, but sometimes if not approached properly, that adoption cycle can become a long-term barrier or an obstacle to, to improvement. 
what's the order we do things in? Do we get do we standardize our processes? Do we implement tools and then have the process support those tools? So there's some questions that need to be answered in that regard as well. So let's move on uh, to the change management plan and how do we address uh, how that addresses the tools and technology dimension. So from a process standpoint, now we have things like, and the analogy here again from a fighter pilot is a checklist. As I go through the cockpit, do I know that the landing gear is down? Do I know that my altimeter is at the right pressure setting for the current altitude of, of the airport? Do I know that the fuel is full? Do I know that the oil pressure levels are properly set? Do I, do I have uh, uh, proper communications with ground and tower? These are all things that happen through a checklist. We follow a process, a standard to ensure that the quality outcomes are there so we don't have a smoking wreck at the end of the runway once once we hit go. So some of the process dimensions are, you know, process itself can be complicated. What's a task? What's a process? How, do they, how does a, a work breakdown structure or a project plan template relate to the overall processes that need to be performed in order for a project to be successful? Some of that gets into project processes versus life cycle processes. Am I doing a, am I doing a task where I'm uh, testing a compound in a clinical trial, or am I doing a task where I'm, I'm reporting status? They're two different things. How does the organization uh, have standard approaches to the different types of projects that will be delivered? Right? Do we have standard approaches? Do we have templates? Or are there, do those standards exist? Are there industry guidelines or regulations that, that need to be considered? Are there things we have to do that aren't optional? Do we have to be safe? Do we have to build drugs that don't kill people before we put them in human beings? Obviously, the answer is yes to that. Right, so what, what are the testing and the guidelines and the regulatory requirements that have to be considered because they become part of the project? Do we have subject matter experts who, who have successfully delivered these things before, some more initiatives? Can we use those types of expertise to, to, to provide process for us? And then at the, at the end of this, we have this idea of change management. What, is it, what are those hurdles out there that we need to overcome for the organization that will get us to the promised land, to the end point? We've covered some of these in some of our previous webinars, so I'm not going to go into a great level of detail on this one. What I want to what I want to get to for now is really the heart of today's presentation, which is best practices for integrating portfolio, project, and life cycle management. This idea of um, even this quote we have here promoting um, communication and persuasion. Right, leaders need to combine an inspiring division of the future, a vision of the future a realistic portrayal of the present, and a selective depiction of the past to make people rise to the challenge of transformation. So how is it that if we know we want to go into some brave new future here as an organization to get better at how we formally select our portfolio and how we formally deliver or execute against that portfolio? How do we do that? And uh, as, a, as a point of context, I wanted to just uh, reference something for those of you familiar with the Project Management Institute, some of these uh, stages of maturity from what's called the organizational project management maturity model. And so we'll, we'll reference that model today when we talk about uh, some best practices for, for improving. So we see the initial developing, define, manage, and optimize. Many of you um, no doubt are familiar with this. If you're not familiar with this, this is uh, uh, simply a, uh, a standard that talks about really how you evolve and how you get to this end state, which is uh, in an optimized end state. Processes are in place to optimize portfolio management and performance. So how do we get there? And a methodology that, that we discuss and that we recommend as a best practice is, is really threefold. And it's standard um, across a lot of consulting methodologies or a lot of uh, uh, best practice improvement methodologies. This idea of uh, first understanding where we are today in assessment of what the current state is. Uh, so we, we, we talk about that. And really in terms of, uh, you'll see three vertical bands. There's actually four vertical bands, but the first three address some of those uh, dimensions, uh, putting process in context. The technology dimension, the process dimension, and the people capabilities dimension. What's the current state? And out of that, we see something like an assessment report. Here's an assessment of the current state. A little bit more detail on that in a minute. The next thing is, what's the 2B or the desired future state? What's the strategy to get there? Again, in these dimensions, consider, in consideration of the tools and technology, in consideration of the processes, standards, tasks, in consideration of the current capabilities of the organization, what should that future state look like? What do we want those capabilities to look like? And then ultimately, if we understand the current state, the desired future state, and what that gap is, what's the roadmap to get us there? And we think of this roadmap, we, we sometimes refer to it as a tactical plan, uh, which you'll see as the deliverable here, a tactical planning document. Uh, at the end of the day, what we're really talking about is a project scope. 
little more detail. Let's get let, let's crawl down and see what we're really talking about here. So an assessment uh, provides current state input to the strategic charter. The outcome is a current capability assessment, a preliminary gap analysis based on the performance of typical organizations. And what do we mean by typical? Uh, we'll show some progressions through the maturity model, some descriptions that we have developed through our experience and how our clients have, have progressed and matured and gotten better over time. The strategic charter, the vision of the future, includes the goals, priorities, and constraints. And the outcome of the strategic charter is a set of goals and high-level recommendations for action. And again, the tactical plan, as I mentioned, it's, it's a charter. It's the scope required to move to the, uh, to the future state. And the outcome of the tactical planning phase is a set of tactical plans. And it, it, we say a set of tactical plans. Uh, you'll see in a moment when I, when I give you a conceptual view of what a tactical plan looks like. It can be phased. It can be a series of tactical plans because this is a journey. We probably don't have a single phase approach, but we have multiple phases to get us to an optimized future state. So an evolution, not a revolution, if you will. So the organizational uh, project management maturity model uh, the, the, the tool we use and recommend is uh, conceptually, and I say conceptually because if you can't read the mouse print on the screen, uh, don't worry. Uh, it was not intended to be read. It's conceptually this. We see a knowledge management band or a project life cycle management band. What's the maturity of the organization around, around life cycle management, around standardizing the processes to deliver the outcomes or the deliverables of the project? Uh, stage gate, if you will, a software development life cycle, a drug farming development life cycle, a construction management life cycle. And then we see the next couple of bands you would recognize for those uh, familiar with the PMBOK, the project management body of knowledge, those knowledge areas. And, and what we have is a description in our experience of what it means to mature from initial ad hoc through developing, if you look at the top, level two, developing, level three, defined, level four, managed, level five, optimized. Uh, the description of what it means to be in each of those areas. For example, if I took time management, and I exploded that band out from, the, from our project management uh, and portfolio management methodology, we would see some progression that would probably look familiar to many of you that says, well, how is it an organization moves forward? Well, we probably start somewhere in an ad hoc level of there's no formal time estimating techniques. That doesn't mean individual project managers don't do this. It doesn't mean no projects are ever estimated with formal techniques. It means as an organization, there's really not an adapted standard for estimating techniques. We see project plans not status for labor, cost, or schedule. We see projects not baseline. We don't take a snapshot of the initial commitments so that later on we have that commitment recorded and we can see variances against those original commitments against the baseline. The next progression point we would often see is uh, some projects are estimated formally. Uh, projects are status for schedule but not labor or cost. Very, very common if you ask people uh, what does a project plan look like? How do you use Microsoft Project? What's the typical output? The answer is going to be a Gantt chart, which essentially is a project plan that, that reflects a schedule. And even those sometimes, once they're committed to, are not updated on a regular basis. Even if they are, we see this project status for schedule, but not labor or cost, and still not baseline. So yeah, we've got a schedule, but we don't capture those original commitments. We don't resource them. We don't apply budgets to them. A next level of progression, we'll see actual time and labor. Uh, tracking is introduced. Critical path uh, may be defined. Uh, formal baselining applied occasionally, maybe not across all projects, but in key projects. Uh, change control processes for schedule revisions is applied. If I have a baseline and somebody now tries to change the schedule, maybe somebody says, whoa, wait a second. We've got a change control process that says we don't just change schedules. We go and have a discussion about this. Some of these discussions may involve integration points to the portfolio level. Meaning, if we think things are going to take longer, we've got to go to some steering committee, some governing body that says this is or is not okay. So we see the maturity moving along. Labor tracked at the project summary level, often that's an initial point, landing point on tracking. Uh, a next level of maturity, level four. Uh, schedules and labor actuals are utilized to improve estimating process. Uh, projects are formally baseline. EVA, earned value analysis, is what that stands for. Projects are formally baseline to enable effective measurement of variances. Labor attracted to work breakdown structure level of detail. Labor is attracted to task level in the project and cost as well. And then the end game, historical variance data can be used across all projects. Why? For a lot of different reasons. To see what previous variances look like, to learn from past, uh, past performance, to improve 
future estimating techniques. Why do I cover this? To give an example of what we mean when we talk about your current state is a 1 or a 2, your desired future state is a 4 or a 5, rather than speaking in terms of, well, we don't really do anything well, but we want to get rates of tracking labor at the task level, that's interesting, but let's look at what your current state is and what the gap is and maybe what the plan needs to be to close that gap. Okay, so conceptually, what does a tactical plan look like? How do you build a business case? Well, we could look at some current findings. What is your current state? Some formal statement, and where do you land on the maturity grid? So that we can say, well, okay, so if I'm a one on knowledge management, a two on scope management, and a one on time management, where am I going next? And we could say phase one, priority one, <coughs> quarter one, if, if there was enough uh, uh, wherewithal in the organization to set an actual schedule commitment. We're going to move up to level two of knowledge management and level three of scope management. What happens next? I see some yellow boxes show up. Move to three on knowledge management, jump all the way to five on scope management, which is important for a lot of organizations. If I don't have a well-defined scope, a lot of these other things are hard to do well. So let's get good at scope first. Time management, we're moving up to a two. So we're going to start uh, statusing our projects for schedule. What's next? We're going to start doing some cost management introduction. We're going to move time management up to level three. We're going to move integration management all the way out to level five. It says formal continu continuous improvement feedback loop exists. Lessons learned are integrated into the overall process. Might be possible, might not. So where do we go with this? Let's, let's talk about the dimensions of a tactical plan. So in a tactical plan, uh, the examples I just used on the previous page talked about a lot of project management type improvements. However, the reality is if you're improving project management, you probably need to do something with portfolio management. You probably need to do something with life cycle management. What do we mean by that? Well, conceptually, you might have a phase one, phase two tactical plan. That tactical plan would contain all those uh, uh, context points, the change management plan, uh, a plan for process development, a plan for technology implementation, a plan for improving people's capabilities, Phase two, yet another movement forward in the overall maturation of the organization. And again, addressing process development for probably new processes, probably more mature processes, probably closer to the right on the maturity model. Technology implementation supporting those processes. So if I've introduced timesheets for labor tracking, my technology needs to reflect that. People capabilities, again, can, can the project managers really do what's being asked from a process and technology standpoint? So let's use a tactical uh, sample tactical plan. Real simple example. And, from a, and we'll see here there's a life cycle set of improvements. There's a, there's a project management set of improvements. And on the next page there's a portfolio management set of improvements. So life cycle management. What are we going to do better in a phase one tactical plan? Train project managers to use the project life, life cycle methodology. Standard phase top terminology with completion milestones for each phase will be introduced. Uh, work breakdown structure with standard life cycle methodology phases defined, and oh, by the way, updated in the project management tools. We see some integration between life cycle and technology. Again, this is just a sample, a very simple sample, just to get the concept across. WBS, work breakdown structure with resource defined and assigned by role. So we have a level of maturity here where, uh, from a time management maturity standpoint, we're going to estimate and assign resources by role to each task, and by the way, we're going to update that in our project management tool. Uh, a risk plan definition and uh, a regular status report, pure project management methodology, if you will, pure business controls for the project. And within that status report, very simply, we're going to introduce schedule milestones, current against baseline, and an up-to-date project summary budget, actual versus baseline. Now, why do we have portfolio management? Because if we want there to be adoption, if we want there to be some governance, so this is not optional aspect of what we're trying to improve. We sort of need to have something like this. And we covered this in great detail in our webinar called Making It Stick. So if, if you want a reference point, a much more detailed reference point, I would invite you to go to our website and, and listen to some of our past recordings. Or in the upcoming uh, two quarters, we'll probably be repeating some of these as webinars as well. So we see defining a governance process. We see executing that process in terms of uh, doing project reviews and audits and providing support to our project managers. We see evaluations. So, so uh, we're going to evaluate the, the, the health of a project. We're going to report against that health. And we're going to do some follow-up. 
What might the follow-up look like? I don't know. We might cancel a project that's 50% off of budget. We, might go ask, we may go ask for more funding. These are the kinds of things that a governance process would do when it sits on top of a project management process. So change management, that's really what we're talking about, are we not? If, we're, if, we're, if we have an audit process and we have a governance process, we're really trying to get to, to, to drive change. So just a couple uh, points here to make. Uh, this, this, uh, if you've ever heard of the Greek god Sisyphus, uh, the punishment for, for, to Sisyphus for wronging the gods is uh, he was damned to, uh, to eternally push a boulder up a hill only to have it roll back down once it reaches the top. So if you've ever tried to implement project management process and technology, you probably felt a little bit like Sisyphus does. You are pushing a boulder uphill. I've heard it described even worse than that, pushing a rope uphill. I'd almost ra rather push a boulder because at least I can get some leverage on it. But uh, this idea of uh, the momentum really doesn't happen until we get to the top and, the and, and, the, and that boulder starts to roll down the other side. So we got to really push on it. And how do we push on it? Uh, well, ineffective change management, sometimes we, we use this thing I call the Moses model. Um, the Moses model is where we have a, typically a PMO who's whose job is to maybe act as a police force, but not so much a, uh, a support mechanism. So why are the tablets cracked? Because they were probably beat over somebody's head. Okay, so we use, it, we use the process as a weapon. We use the process as a, as a demand. And, uh, but maybe we don't supply a lot of support to the organization. So if we're going to write uh, some rules and regulations uh, for the road, we're going to also teach people how to drive on the road. And, to, and closely related to that is this thing we kiddingly call the memo from Bob. And the memo from Bob declares that, you know, effective next Monday, now that you've all been through training, poof, uh, follow the process and make it work. And that's okay as a component. We do want executive support, don't get me wrong. But wrapped around that, we want this idea of a governance process that defines how we're going to support and enable our project managers and make them effective. Well, what does that mean? What does, what, you know, what does adoption look like? How can we be more effective at, at uh, improvement and adoption? And so I want to go through really what you would almost call an adoption maturity model. We talked about the maturity of project management in terms of, again, using time management as an example, being as, as uh, lower down on the maturity scale as we don't even have a formal estimating technique. We don't even status our schedules. We don't even apply resource to our plans. We just put schedules out and change them whenever we feel like it, all the way up through we're tracking them. We've got variances. We've got previous experience to, to, to draw against. We know what our variances are. We're on top of it. So looking at those sort of uh, ends of the spectrum, if you will, or different ends of the pendulum, we have a similar thing in the adoption world. For example, some of the most basic adoption we see is this, this idea of taking off-the-shelf ad hoc types of, of, of uh, improvements to the organization. So grab some off-the-shelf training take some non-standard, that should probably really say non-customized non process. So it's, it, it could be a standard process that's uncustomized. We're just going to take the pin box and hand it out to project managers and say, here, do this. Uh, using out-of-the-box technology, we're just going to roll out a project management tool like a Microsoft Project Server, but we're not going to do anything to really make it malleable and, and, and fit for the organization. It's going to be a, you know, a blob of clay. It's not, not fit and not customized to the use of the organization. So that's sort of the most basic. Um, we have seen some of these implementations. We haven't seen them succeed, but it does happen, and you may have seen them in your organization as well. So where do we go from here in terms of adoption maturity? Well, if we move to the right, the most obvious thing we do is we, we begin to tailor some of these artifacts. Uh, that, and again, look, look, at the, look at the dimensions we're talking about. Training is the people dimension. Process is, is the process dimension, and then we have the technology dimension. So what we're really talking about is an adoption plan that that makes these dimensions or these these coexisting components uh, more able to drive improvement within the organization. So what what do we do? Training reflects uh, the organization's process, and it's aligned with the deployed technology. Well, what's the mirror image of that look like from a process standpoint? It reflects and integrates a client-specific methodology. What does technology's mirror image look like? It's aligned to the organization's level of process maturity. And by the way, is appropriate to the capabilities of the people in the organization. Okay, so that's cool. But if I just send people through training and again hand them a set of binders, is that good enough? I'll say no. Initial adoption driven by mentoring and coaching. So maybe we help folks. So the Moses model says I beat them over the head with the stone tablets. What does the other model look like? Well, how about a model where 
we have more rigorous requirements uh, where like there's regularly scheduled follow-up sessions mandatory curriculum for skill improvements that get followed. There's an end state of skill improvement in mind, and there's a series of training and support and mentoring events. Uh, focusing on the integration of technology and process, and, and the last bullet, initial focus on helping, not policing. So we're here to help. If you're not sure what you're doing, we're going to show you and help you how to do it. As we turn up the heat and get closer to the right, uh, adoption, review, and audit. So yeah, we're going we're gonna to sit down with you as mentors and we're going to review it with you, but at some point we're actually going to have this overarching portfolio governance process that integrates with the project execution process that leads right into the second bullet that says there's an audit process that exists and its functioning is a key component of improving project management maturity. We have an, an, an audit process, a governance process, a portfolio process that says our job is to help, and not only help, but demand that there's improvement in the project management maturity and that we are going to take responsibility for that and we're going to drive it. Okay, so how's the impact seen? It's in the effectiveness of project results. Yes, that's one way. Are you delivering on time and on budget? But not only that, it's not good enough to deliver on time on budget. We want to see standardization of the adoption of the process because by definition, ad hoc means 10 different project managers doing things their way. That doesn't mean we couldn't have 10 projects come in on time on budget, but it probably means that they're not following an organizational standard. So the idea is to adopt an organizational standard. So why? So we can have an integrated report, an integrated dashboard, integrated key performance indicators, and at the portfolio level, an integrated view of how overall projects have gone. What happens next? Well, if I'm going to audit projects, I'm going to see what their health is. At some level, if I do an adoption review, I also want to have uh, some sort of grading, reporting, escalation mechanism. Okay, so if I review a project, is there some formal way to report on its health? Do I have uh, almost like bonds, if you will? Is there A-level credit versus B-level credit? How do we define that? Uh, so we will have, and, and by the way, what does escalation look like? Well, we take it to stakeholders. Uh, standards include, include connection to performance, evaluation, planning, and adoption, and compensation. And at the end, how do we intervene and, and provide corrective action? What is the overall, the analogy I use is that is if I'm the person paying for singing lessons, um, what am I doing to make sure you know how to sing at the end of the day, or if you will, benefits realization. Okay, so specific actions that must be followed based on project health and the overall standards adoption. An unhealthy project in, at a level C that says, let's say level C uh, defines a project that is currently having significant variances of budget and schedule more than 50% of the original baseline and there's no risk mitigation plan to get it back on track. Okay, great. So now I got to see what happens now. Right? What's the overall escalation point? What do we do? We take it to a steering committee. Is it once a month? Do we cancel it? Do we go get refunding or reallocation of new monies? And by the way, how does that affect the individual project managers and other people responsible for supporting the project? So that's the overall, uh, again, I would call this an adoption maturity cycle. and where does this come from? It comes from the tactical plan. Right? Why does the tactical plan need to have a change management dimension? Why does it need to have a portfolio governance process dimension? Because in order to integrate, again, back to the original point, what's the tie it together point? If we're going to do something like integrate portfolio management, project management, and, and uh, project life cycle management, there needs to be a plan. Okay, so there needs to be some understanding of where we are today. There needs to be a vision of the future. There needs to be a tactical plan to get us there. So ultimately, when we talk about driving adoption, we are really talking about having some sort of plan about how we, uh, you know, the details of a tactical plan at the governance level probably would look something like this. Okay, so what I'd like to do is spend just a couple of minutes on next steps and get to some questions. Uh, the next step, schedule a project assistance PPM improvement readiness briefing. We can, if you're interested, uh, help you with these challenges. So the first bullet says, what's a briefing? Focuses on, focuses on what is required for successful portfolio and project improvements in your organization. So we call it a mini assessment. Okay, so we bring a methodology, which we talked about today, to take you through a brief review of your organization's current state and desired future state. A set of questions is how we get there. Uh, using a roadmap to develop a scope and justify investment, which we can help with. 
Okay, so we want to get better at project management. How do I take this to my management team and convince them that this is a good idea? Uh, what are some of the common PPM challenges? So has this been tried before in your organization? Probably. So we, are there some ill-conceived uh, technology deployments and the harmful effect? We don't want to do this anymore because the last one was painful. We spent $5 million on a technology deploy and it didn't go well. And by the way, the technology gets blamed often uh, and, and it shouldn't have been probably in many cases. Uh, common training and competency development shortcomings. And uh, finding the appropriate methodology and guidance. So if there's interest in hearing some more about this, uh, Jan's contact information is here. Uh, please feel free to contact Jan directly. Also, one other point for next steps, we do have a, a webinar uh, coming up on enterprise transformation, what your executive team needs to know about project and portfolio management. That will be on November 12th. Uh, details, if you want to register, are on the screen here. Go to projectassistance.com slash events if you wish to register. Also, our recorded previous events, including today, will be there. And in terms of project assistance, it might not surprise you to know that what we do is we help our clients get better at what we talked about today. So we, our, our, our value proposition, our mission is to transform our client's approach to portfolio and project management to achieve a standard of excellence and execution. At the end of the day, it's how you get the outcomes. How do we deliver the expected project outcomes? How do we reduce the risk? How do we maximize the return on investment? Why do I say this? Because if you think about it, people, organizations uh, are reluctant to get into these types of transformation. Getting better at project and portfolio management feels like it's going to be risky. It's going to take a long time. It's going to require a lot of change. Yes, all those things are true, but there are approaches that can reduce the risk, can show incremental ROI, can speed the realization of value, and can drive an effective organizational change, and that's what we do for a living. They come in six practice areas. Our project and portfolio management services we talked about today, uh, the strategy component. There are others in there as well. Collaboration, we do a lot with SharePoint, uh, very, very popular, uh, fast-growing collaborative uh, portal technology, and also a component of Microsoft Project Server. Um, education and competency, that's our training arm. Application development or, 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 or customization. Project management outsourcing, we have service levels we can provide instead of on an hourly basis or on a staffing basis or on a deliverables basis. We actually have service levels we can define these things and deliver them through. And project and portfolio staffing, an important component of our business. We can also su supply project managers to run projects. So with that, we are at the 50-minute mark or the 49-minute mark. Anyhow, we have a few minutes held at the end here. So while I'm talking, uh, I invite you to feverishly uh, think of your ideas and, and bang them in on the console. Uh, just a quick reminder, if you're interested in submitting a question, there is a question and answer widget, if you will, that you can pop down. And if you want to send a question, you'll see on, in the question and answer log, you can type in a question. We'll see it. And uh, Jan has begun to monitor the question. We have our first question, which is, can you send us a copy of the slides? Uh, what I would ask you to do, uh, oh, I'm sorry, Jan just told me she already answered. So am I turning the, the questions over to you now, Jan? Okay, I'm, I'm being reminded here that our moderator will take the questions, so, and uh, I'll take the answers if possible. Take it away, Jan. Thanks, Gus. We have already received one question, so I'll start with that. When you reviewed the sample tactical plan, you showed a plan to improve all three process domains. In your experience, do customers typically attack project and portfolio management at the same time? Okay. I'm reading the question again, just briefly. Reviewed a, I reviewed a tactical plan. That was on slide 27. Okay, actually, I don't think that was. I guess this is a tactical plan. Okay, so do customers. In your experience, do customers typically attack project and portfolio management at the same time? That's a good question. Um, first of all, depending on the, the level in the organization we're at, uh, drives whether portfolio or project management is the primary driver. Are we talking to somebody who's trying to do the right projects? Or are we trying to talk to somebody who's trying to do projects right? So as we get more senior in the organization, there is a, there's, a, there's a desire to do portfolio management first. As we get uh, into more of the execution, the people responsible for running the projects, they're more anxious to, to get the execution or project management right. But I would, I would still say the answer is both. Uh, while we may have an, an initial emphasis on driving success in our tactical plan primarily around portfolio management, it's pretty hard to get real far into successful portfolio management 
if I can't measure the status of my projects. So we get into this whole concept of, I'm going to go back to slide nine, uh, when you see uh, this idea of delivering on a project in my portfolio management process, I sort of have to get into this concept in the middle of my execution and control processes. How do I track my status? How do I get variance and root causes analysis? How do I communicate to management what's going on? So we, we show, therefore, on purpose, uh, this, this sort of integrated view. I'm sorry, I'm sorry, I went to the wrong slide. We saw on slide 28 this integrated view where we intentionally peeled off some examples in a tactical plan of doing some life cycle management, some examples of doing project management, and, and I think what is a very good example of why you need some governance process because people don't just wake up one morning and say, I feel like getting better at project management, and all 50 of us project managers are going to create a grassroots movement and we're all going to get better at project management. So uh, an important note is uh, also that the purpose of the strategy and tactical plan is to directly address the sequencing of the original maturation process. Right, so th this whole question of what do I do first, what do I do second, what do I do third, really all that is, is predicated on this concept that I have an assessment, a strategic charter, a tactical plan, where I, I am in fact defining the sequence of these activities. Any other questions, Jan? I do have one more right now, Gus. Is it best to implement technology first and then develop the supporting processes or vice versa? Uh, good question. In some cases, process does exist, and that makes it very much easier to implement technology. Oftentimes, though, there's a need to improve process in order for the technology to be effective. So what we've seen work best is to make sure there's agreement on process standards before implementing technology. Um, you know, if, if you've seen SAP, anybody involved in an SAP implementation, what they kind of tell you is SAP has a set of best practices, and you're going to need to change your processes to mimic the methodology uh, of, of, the, of, of the technology. Why is that? Well, it's because, the, you know, the thought is that the technology was built with best practice in mind. So if I have a project management tool that enables best practice, and my organization doesn't have a best practice around tracking actuals or grabbing variances, or having a standard approach to what it means to be over budget and be unacceptable and have to be escalated up to a steering committee, those standards need to be defined. So if we define those standards first, it makes it a lot easier. Great example, we'll walk in to gather configuration requirements for, uh, I'll just say project server, Microsoft project server. What do you want your dashboards to look like? Hmm, we're not sure. What do you want your red light, green light, yellow light status to be based on? 5% over budget, 10% over budget, 25% over budget? Gee, let's go ask the executives. Well, here we're looking at, in that case, if we don't have the answer, a lack of process standard having been defined for how we're going to escalate projects. So to find a process first, how do we do that? Again, an important note, the purpose of the strategy and tactical plan is to directly address the sequence of the original maturation process. Thank you. Gus, that's all the questions we have right now. So I'd like to thank everyone for joining us today and remind you that a recording of this webinar will be available on the events page of our website within the next 24 hours. Thanks for joining us.